Well, I'm very fortunate to be part of a small group uh, church that meets primarily online, and we meet every Wednesday night. And uh, we call this fellowship and prayer. It started out during COVID because everybody was so lonely. <laughs> and so what really happens is that we have chit chat for about an hour, and then we read a psalm and we pray. <laughs> and they found out that I was coming here. There are about nine of us that, that do this. And they said, oh, please send us your paper. And I thought, <laughs> I don't think that's such a Uh, we've now sent the Chuck's paper. It's hair splitting. And I'm going to say, well, let's keep on splitting hair. Okay. So, um, a big thank you to the society for including me. adopting the following three premises. <clears throat> philosophy and theology are engaged in the same quest. Um, philosophy and theology are both accountable to that which inspires and ignites their common quest. Philosophy and theology are mutually correcting. To think of the relationship between philosophy and theology in this way promises to enhance the quality of any endeavor you make to satisfy the mind's desire for understanding. If I may be so presumptuous as to appropriate the Aristotelian conceit I have placed as an epigram to my remarks, our desire for understanding is infinite, and for this reason we may nobly and rightly say that it is a desire for the infinite. The opening sentences of Michael Dummett's book, The Logical Basis of Metaphysics, may serve as the first reason I offer for accepting the premise that philosophy and theology are engaged in the same quest. He wrote, the layman or non-professional expects philosophers to answer deep questions of great import for our understanding of the world. Do we have free will? Can the soul or mind exist apart from the body? How can we tell what is right and what is wrong? Is there any right and wrong? Or do we just make it up? Could we know the future or affect the past? Is there a God? And the layman is quite right. If philosophy does not aim at answering such questions, it is worth nothing. My first reason then for accepting the premise that theology and philosophy are engaged in the same quest is an invocation of authority, surprisingly, the authority of the leading analytic philosopher of the 20th century. But weightier reasons are available, and I wish to develop them by considering Anselm's argument for the reality of God and Marcus Gabriel's argument that the world does not exist. I will examine them in their historical order. In each case, I will offer a brief exposition of the argument in question by way of illuminating the purposes that each thinker pursued and the nature of their reasons for concluding what they did. I will conclude by showing what each has to offer by way of critical correction of the other's understanding. Anselm's arguments for the reality of God begin with an expression of desire. He prays that God will give him to understand that God is and that God is what we believe him to be. The understanding he received, he articulated with the phrase that God is the one, quote, than which nothing greater can be conceived. As you know, he expresses what God gave to his understanding with this designation in two importantly different formulations. There is widespread agreement that the second formulation is the more persuasive, not to say compelling one, its brevity allows me to quote in full. The second formulation begins by referring to the conclusion of the first, according to which something than which a greater cannot be conceived undoubtedly both stands in relation to the understanding 
and exists in reality. And then the second formulation. This so truly is that it is impossible to think of it as not existing. It can be conceived to be something such that we cannot conceive of it as not existing. This is greater than something which we can see as not existing. There Therefore, if that than which a greater cannot be conceived could be conceived not to be, we would than which a greater cannot be conceived so truly is that it is impossible even to conceive of it as not existing. This is you, O Lord our God, you so truly are that you cannot be thought not to be, and rightly so. For if some mind could conceive of something better than you, the creature would rise above its creator and would judge its creator, which would be completely absurd. Also, whatever else there is, except for you alone, can be conceived not to be. In his book, God and the Philosophers, Keith Ward says that Anselm's argument, quote, is a good test of whether you are really a philosopher. If it seems like verbal trickery, then you are not a philosopher and you should do something more useful. <laughs> but if it seems irritatingly convincing, then you are a philosopher and you are condemned to agonize about problems that most people have never heard of for the rest of your life. All I'm asking is that you think about it for the next few minutes. Not, I must be clear, for the purpose of determining whether it succeeds, but simply for the purpose of understanding the argument and one particular facet of it. Notice that Anselm does not say that we Christian believers cannot conceive of God existing. He simply says we, that lovely, maximally inclusive human first person plural pronoun. A somewhat rash rejoinder is that, well, obviously God can be conceived as not existing because a lot of people conceive of God in that way. But that reply is exposed for its superficiality by pointing out that it fails to notice two things. First, Anselm has supplied a name for what it is, the existence of which is in question. So if one is to reject his conclusion, one can do that only by addressing what it is that he says is named by the name God. A rebuttal that changes the subject is not a rebuttal. Second, to successfully rebut Anselm's claim that God cannot be thought of as not existing, one must take into account his last exposition of his conceptual formula for naming God. And I quote, also, whatever else there is, except for you alone, can be conceived not to be. A moment's reflection should make it obvious that Anselm is correct in claiming that everything other than God can be conceived not to be. There's no conceptual obstacle to conceiving reality as devoid of me or you or the sun, moon, and stars, or you see his point. Now, if we attempt to extend this possible non-existence to everything whatsoever, in any world whatsoever, we must undertake to form a thought of nothing. This conceit that nothing might have existed is invited by the question, why is there something and not nothing? But the question is literally meaningless. No thought of nothing can be formed any more than a thought of a square circle can be formed. That there is necessarily something follows from the emptiness of the concept nothing. Moreover, we should also notice that the final exposition of that in which greatness consists does not imply that rejection of Anselm's conclusion results in contradiction. There's an important difference between holding two logically contradictory ideas and failing to form an idea. There is incoherence in both cases, and that incoherence can probably be named nonsense, but they are different kinds of nonsense. The first kind can be cured by paying a logical price of abandoning one or the other of the ideas in play. The second cannot be fixed. And the semantic price of claiming otherwise is not to contradict oneself, but it is to mouth nonsense. Understanding Anselm's argument in this way allows me to identify his quest, the impetus for that quest, and some philosophical relevance of his discovery. 
cancel argument originates from experience. It is an experience of something other than himself. He names this experience belief in God. That belief has two parts, belief that God is and what God is. Subsequently, Anselm's experience, Anselm experiences a desire that his awareness may be properly understood as he initially understood it. That is to say, as an experience of God who is categorically different from himself, who is real not only in thought, but also real as that about which we think. What Anselm wants is greater intelligibility of his experience. His quest is to release appropriate studies of his life and in a percent is the original experience of that which is categorically different from himself. And illusion can be understood as a description of his quest. It is a quest to comprehend contingency, the content of his faith, through conceiving that which exists. The world does not exist will supply us reasons to circumscribe the extent to which, while it is a safe assumption that all of us have taken a careful look at Anselm's famous argument, I'm going to assume that it's necessary to recount some of Gabriel's achievements by way of justifying my selection of his thought as a worthy example of philosophy that can illuminate the relationship between it and theology. Born in 1980, he became Germany's youngest philosophy professor ever named to a university chair at the age of 29. He holds that chair for epistemology, modern and contemporary philosophy at the University of Bonn. He has been a visiting professor in Lisbon, Berkeley, New York, Naples, Venice, Rio de Janeiro, where in each case he lectured in a local language. He is a regular guest professor at the Sorbonne and the New School of Social Research. His book, By the World Does Not Exist, was a seller in Germany and has been translated into 13 languages. He is that rare sort of thinker who combines mastery of his discipline with a facility for expressing his views in a pleasing and easily understood manner. I'm tempted to say that he addresses Bertrand Russell's concern, echoed some decades later by Rosic, that since Kant, philosophy has become so technical that non-specialists could not benefit from it. Beyond that, I commend his work to your attention because I think it offers the potential for dramatic improvement in the intellectual hygiene of our time. And I would say that I owe my awareness of uh, Professor Gabriel to my good friend, Ansi Jaranjtik. So thank you, Ansi, very much. Um, so, what does Gabriel mean when he says the world does not exist? His answer, one can understand his answer. One can understand the claim that the world does not exist precisely in this sense. It is simply false that everything is connected. There is simply no rule or world formula that describes everything. This is not contingent on the fact that we have not found it, but on the fact that it cannot exist at all. Gabriel's confidence in this startling blunt pronouncement is invited by a collection of reasons presented in the just mentioned book and more technically in his monograph, Transcendental Ontology, Essays in German Idealism. <clears throat> it might escape notice that there are two different reasons in the two sentences just quoted. First, everything is not connected. Second, there's no rule or formula that describes everything. But we can reasonably ask, does exist mean connected to everything or instantiates a rule? Gabriel says that the apparently obvious answer to the question of what it means to exist is something exists only when it is found in the world. Where should anything exist if not in the world in which everything takes place, whatever happens? That said, the world itself is not found in the world. Here is a third reason for denying the existence of the world. If to exist means to appear in the world, then the world cannot appear in itself. One might think of a larger world containing a smaller one, but we quickly see that the need for larger worlds will be infinite. According to Gabriel, that infinity reveals that, quote, we can never grasp the whole. While he says that the world exists, he is there to affirm that everything else does exist. I claim, he says, that there are unicorns on the far side of the moon that are wearing police uniforms. 
for this thought exists in the world and with it unicorns that are wearing police uniforms. The existence of these <laughs> unicorns in the world does not include their existence in the universe, which Gabriel names the quote object domain of natural science. The many self exists. <laughs> now it cannot escape your notice that if Gabriel does hold that the world does not exist, he cannot define existence as what is found in the world. And indeed, when he raises the question more carefully as what it means to exist at all, he replies, existence is the sense. It's helpful to keep in mind that the English word sense translates the German word Zinn. So he is not confining existence to objects apprehended by sensation. But then that is obvious, given the existence of unicorns, unicorns wearing police uniforms. But it's also given the existence of the Federal Republic of Germany. Gabriel's immediately appealing assertion that the world cannot appear in the world implies that there is not one unified field of sense in which all other fields of sense appear. It would seem, however, that he has smuggled in a rule that could define a connection between all existing realities in that all existence share the property of appearing in a field of sense. There are two reasons why this does not constitute a flaw in his theory. First, objects appear in different fields of sense in different ways. Appearing is not a univocal concept. Second, this potential defeater of his doctrine that the world does not exist is addressed by a further clarification of what it means to exist. To exist is to be differentiated, to stand out. To exist is to be differentiated by properties. The answer to two questions supply the crucial reasons why the world does not exist. First, can an object exist that has all the properties there are and form a thought of a super object that has all properties? He says you cannot form such a thought without accompanying it with the background against which this super object stands out. The most likely candidate for this background which stands out would be your own consciousness. But then you have two realities and not one all-inclusive one, since everything is differentiated from the background. It might seem that this role of your consciousness as the background in which the super object appears would require a yes answer to the second question, namely that consciousness is the other in contrast to all other objects. But analysis reveals that not to be the case, not simply because the empty form of thought of everything failed because it required a background against which to stand out, but also because thinking consciousness as not everything else does not provide any content for the thought of consciousness. If we try to think of an object that is not any other object or like any other object, we have not thought of something. As I have suggested in my remarks about Anselm's argument, one cannot form a thought about nothing which seems to me to be Gabriel's argument against absolute differentiation, namely that it is a concept without content and as such no concept at all. The impossibility of absolute differentiation does not imply the impossibility of relative differentiation. As Gabriel says, Coca-Cola contrasts with Pepsi, beer, wine, ice pop, and many other things, but it does not contrast with rhinoceroses. You would never think to say to a waiter, bring me a Coke, but if you don't have a Coke, a rhinoceros will do. There are relative differentiations, but there is no absolute differentiation. In other words, to say a Coke is not a rhinoceros does not tell you anything at all about what a Coke is. Gabriel's quest in his popular book, Why the World Does Not Exist, and in his much more fully developed realist ontology, Fields of Sense, is to offer an analysis of existence. Like Anselm's effort, his is an effort to render himself more intelligible to himself through consideration of the limits of thinking. His quest is pursued by interrogating possibilities of thought. It yields the following reasons for why existence cannot be claimed for the sum of everything. 
Let me summarize his reasons for this conclusion. Everything is not connected. There's no rule or formula that describes everything. The world cannot appear in itself. We can never grasp the whole. No object can have all the properties there are because to have all properties would be to fail to stand out. No object can be absolutely different from all other objects because absolute differentiation is an empty concept. Each of these reasons is the conclusion to various thought experiments and each, draw, each draws conclusions about what exists on the basis of what cannot be thought. Gabriel develops this analysis of existence in opposition to Kantian despair that we can know things in themselves, the root of constructism, and to scientism, according to exist, is to be comprehensible in terms of natural sciences. The problem with the, quote, scientific worldview is not that it claims to be scientific, but rather that it is a worldview and the world does not exist. Enthusiasts for that chimera, the biblical worldview, please take note. One can know Coke, the real thing itself, but one's intelligibility of a brand. Brands, nonetheless, as is to wit, Rao's marinara sauce. It might seem that Anselm and Gabriel are not engaged in the same quest after all, since it is clear that they do not ask exactly the same question. If the quest is defined by the question, then they are not involved in the same quest because they're not asking the same question. Anselm asks whether God exists in reality and not just in thought. Gabriel asks if the world exists. Interestingly, Gabe, given Gabriel's understanding of existence, he can remark in his discussion of the meaning of religion, given existence means appearing in a field of sense, that, quote, in any event, it's obvious that God exists. But for Gabriel to say that obviously God exists is not so very theologically satisfying, since he has previously said that unicorns wearing police uniforms on the dark side of the moon exist. Gabriel can be understood to respond to Anselm by saying that if God exists in thought, he exists simpliciter. However, we can preserve the force of Anselm's concern and the substantial nature of his conclusion by translating it into Gabriel's terms as a question about the field of sense in which God appears. Exploring all kinds of ambiguity that one can look to, I offer to translate Anselm's concern into the question of whether God exists in the field of sense of agent causation in the human story. We know that Anselm's answer to that question is yes, given his investigation of the question, why God became man. And given my restatement of Anselm's desire, we have reason to suppose that he and Gabriel are engaged in the same quest after all, namely a quest for understanding what can or cannot be included in reality existence albeit in relation to different candidates for inclusion. Now, if we recall that the reasons each gives for their answers to their folks questions are all forms of the claim that it is possible to form thoughts that contradict their answers to their questions, then it will be clear what sort of accountability they accept and how each suggests a correction of the other on the basis of that accountability. Prepared as I am to be convinced otherwise, I think myself Except one, it can be thought, it exists, and if it cannot be thought, it cannot exist. Given Gabriel's rejection of any all-inclusive field of sense and his analysis of existence as appearance in a field of sense, it's not surprising that he asserts the proposition that every exist is contingent. It might have been otherwise, but if Anselm, as I've interpreted, is correct, and it is not true that everything that appears in a field of sense might not have appeared at all. Anselm corrects Gabriel by appeal to the same form of
reason that Gabriel accepts in the development of his dark. arguments against the So the world, namely what cannot be thought. More significantly, Gabriel actually applied assertion that, quote, it is impossible that there is absolutely not to a conceptual task that Gabriel's reasons for the non-existence of the world suggest. Just is as impossible as conceiving of nothing. Anselm says that we conceive of, quote, that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Gabriel's thought experience, a maximum number, should serve as a criterion for assessing the con conceivability of a greatest one. Moreover, I want to call it exists necessarily. Early, because the concept of absolutely nothing is impossible. All that we have arrived at is a necessary existence. We have not arrived at pure goodness, simple truth, or infinite beauty. And even if Anselm's argument discloses a necessary existent, it does not follow that that we can grasp it conceptually, that is, form a thought about it, other than that it cannot fail to exist. Indeed, Gabriel's reason for denying absolute differentiation namely that such differentiation can have no content is a direct challenge to the apophaticists resorted at one point or another in their discourse about God. In conclusion, Anselm and Gabriel are engaged in the same quest, namely discovery of what can be known to exist. They are motivated by the desire to test the adequacy of their thoughts against the limit of what can be thought at all, and they accept accountability for the limits of thinking. Anselm supplies a reason for denying the contingency of all existence, Gabriel posed by his demonstration that every domain of sense is finite. to word this. I have no idea if I'm going to be successful um, to introduce it to Mark Stigl. I had uh, no idea if this works. So, uh, in the paragraph for a lack of um, because it has no content, I'm, I'm trying to formulate in my uh, an epistemological sort of throwing of that. Or if it is this uh, truly different from, absolutely different from, if it's the latter, then I, I can't know. So yeah, wondering. yeah, yeah. Well, I think of it in terms of uh, all we can say about God is what he's not. 
So when I think of apophaticism, um, I do think that people have resorted to because of the sense of mystery that um, um, our the paper just before mine, who's was what was his name? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I, I love the question because, um, um, I, and on, on an earlier time, I was thinking about the Christian doctrine of creation and ex nihilo. And if I am close to having something useful to say about concept, nothing that would raise a question about that doctrine, you know, how can we say God created? creates out of nothing if we can't form a concept of nothing. And um, I was at the time I was reading um, John happiness, death and the remainder of life. And in it, he for trying to figure out what is happiness. And he says, no, what it is. And he's, so he resorts to this concept of happiness in the Nicomachean ethic he did was to pose a question that people hadn't posed before. I don't know whether that's historically accurate or not, but he says, you can't determine whether somebody's happy until you know their whole life. And by saying the only way to know if someone is happy is to examine their whole life, you create this enigmatic signifier, which draws people to entertain the question, how shall I live my life? Right? And, and so I think that that's a promising concept for or discourse about God if you're drawn to the idea that you can't say anything positive about God because God is such a transcendent mystery that no concept about him or her fits. <clears throat> um, so I, I don't want to, I mean, obvious, a very uh, deep, but I think it's, it's rife with attempt to say whatever you want or, or say nothing at all. And much about Gabriel, uh, you know, and I like his style. <laughs> um, in philosophy, by which he means we are looking to be able to, one of the reasons he gives for claiming that everything is contingent. And because of that, we're actually able to be wrong. You know, if you if you can't. Yeah, I was going to push a little bit on the same question about the fallacies. Because I, I, uh, I think the tradition's use of, of I mean, I think about um, I mean, philology in a pretty metaphysical key, but analogy also is a, is a linguistic. For when, when 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 Thomas says we only know what God is not, not what God is. Uh, is is an, is an analogical state. God's not right. a thing among things. <laughs> right. um, and then we can look at the world, and I think Israel, that the world is totally contingent. But if it was to be held together, there is one thing. Um, it would need to be grasped by something infinite, right? That's, there's a sense in which, yeah. um, and I and I think that that's deeply resonant with things that are baked into the Christian tradition. Rick Rice and I had the privilege of being at, uh, well, I think you were there, Rick, when the meet, celebrate at the time of the death of Aquinas and Bonner both came and gave lectures. And they both titled their lectures, The Incomprehensibility of God. Annoyed by that. <laughs> it was like, wait a minute. You know, there are a lot of people who would agree with you. You guys were talking about God don't make any sense. Right? I bought the issue of the journal of religion that had both of those lectures in it. And I went back and read them and I discovered that in fact, what they were saying was there is no way for us to comprehensively 
under no idea what you're saying. Saying that's why I asked the question I did of, of Yazid. You know, it's, it's one thing to say, and it's another thing to say it's incomplete. And and I think would you say that apophaticism is a way of saying it's incomplete? Uh, is contingent. Uh, I think we could logically say, and it, it, it's contingent upon that which is not contingent. Yeah. When we say the word absolute. Actually, know what it means to say that God is absolute. Uh, creates, other than that God is not. About that, but I, I definitely, you know, there are a host of weeks that I don't think that we can actually get to an absolute existent simply by noticing that something must necessarily exist because you could get an infinite regress, right? Well, no, I, don't. I mean, I think that that's part of the, that's part of the claim. Yeah. Not an regress. Right. And, or, I mean, I think that, I mean, a different person you could bring into this would be Heidegger. Right. Where, uh, when we talk about being, we, we use the word as a noun. But it, 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 it goes back to a, a, a verb, right? Yeah. So, you know, someone like, again, like Thomas says, well, God, God is, is a subject, God is being a subject. Right. Um, God is this act of existence that is um, less susceptible to some of those critiques. We agree that, <clears throat> well, I would put it this way, that I think, and this was the reason for the title I chose, I think the mind's desire is to come to rest at something which is fully intelligible and if you have, have an infinite regress you never get the threat and skepticism right that you don't you don't ultimately know anything because you constantly for intelligibility and there's always another answer why does daryl ward exist well because ellen swayze met james ward in st paul minnesota right well why did that happen and you know you can keep going and, and so that to me would be an answer I would offer to anyone who would say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, your concern about nothing implying the impossibility of a, of a concept with content of nothing implying that something exists necessarily. All it gets you is that there are, there's always another contingent thing there. And, and Gabriel actually holds that. He actually thinks that um that that there's a necessity to contingency yeah. right so so that there's no alternative to contingency the idea that there might be an absolute he rejects sure sure and and, and so and i think the other thing matt just to kind of refer to something else um you know rick bryce taught me a lot about problems with classical theism and and i think that 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 whole conversation is relevant to what i was talking about here because one argument against the reality of god is your doctrine of god doesn't make any sense right it, it, and um, efforts to cure that problem, um, I think, are only partially successful. I think there is still that challenge available to the unbeliever to say, well, what you're talking about, God, ultimately doesn't work. And, and that would be a very serious, uh, just one more thing. <laughs> David Burrell has a book, uh, Aquinas, God in Action. And I bought that precisely to find out if somebody had an answer to the kinds of problems that Rick has raised so effectively. <laughs> and when I started reading it, to my disappointment, he argues that Aquinas doesn't have a doctrine. God. A doctrine. And I was like, wow, what am I supposed to make?
make of this. Um, so anyway, I'll show you. Thank you so much for your paper. It's clear and also uh, very provocative. And you know, I'm a very, very uh, big admirer of medieval kind of philosophy and, and and I'm kind of wondering if you two different positions, uh, particularly kind of pre-critical, post-critical philosophy, namely the linguistic term. And I'm kind of wondering where you're, where you're at right now. Right? So there are those uh, Thomas kind of, of um, who look at these on the, on the sort of language games that pushes the edge of what language can conceive of. Right? Uh, so, so they tend to focus on language rather than consciousness because consciousness is a very controversial kind of thing in itself. And then there are those who, like Ed Fezzer, right, who continue to believe that these categories, uh, as you said, there's a, a hunger for coherence right. in human beings. And so that pushes us to want to always examine the background of all backgrounds, right? So the example you gave was, you know, we can't really conceive of anything without some greater background against which we conceive of something, which is why uh, for people in the classical tradition, any modern conception of God that thinks of God as having an attribute or acting temporally is not God because that would be identifiable as an object within the cosmic furniture of objects. So, so I'm kind of wondering and the, and the famous argument, of course, made by Kant, that in that reality comports uh, with that hunger for infinity. So I'm kind of wondering where you're, uh, where you're at in terms of that. Thing. Yeah. Well, I'm impressed by the opposite uh, kind of move that I think Anselm and Gabriel both make in trying to make their points, which is a challenge to, okay, think of what it is that would, re that would refute me. Right? Think about God. For example, if you think that God's essay in um, his book, The Hidden and the Manifest, in which he says, you cannot have attributes of God, because if you do, you have an entity, story, if you will, of the attributes. <laughs> Well, that was a brand new thought for me. And it, and it actually then calls into question the critique of classical theism, right? Because the critique of classical theism says, you have attributed a set of attributes to God, which are self-contradictory. And, and so it doesn't make any sense. And um, so I'm impressed by the, you can't think of it argument. And I think that the Kant objection, well, you can think about a hundred dollars in your pocket, but just because Because actually having a hundred dollars in your pocket would be greater than not. That doesn't put a hundred dollars in your pocket. And yeah, who can argue with that? Except that <laughs> Anselm's with the very thought of which provides information. And and in this case, it's a negative thought. You cannot form the concept of, and I think Anselm is saying, you can't say as much as, as I thought Anselm was very valuable for. Anselm says, if you're not thinking about something that is the greater than anything that else can be conceived, you're not the of linguistic term, which says, you know, if you're, um, if you're thinking about anything that is less than the greatest, then that's not God. So if you're thinking about something that can, in Hart's terms, if you're thinking about an object, if you're thinking about an object that has God is, that God is infinitely transcendent of all other reality. And, and there's only one. The problem with the attribute use is that you wind up with something that's greater than God while you're trying to talk about God. Right. And, and so, I mean, the one person that I know who could be really helpful on this is Roy Benton, who can talk to us about <laughs> things like de re and de dicto necessity. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. 
I mean, I just want to point out carefully that if even if Anselm is right that the concept of nothing is inconceivable, it does not follow the de re reality that there is one thing that is itself right. indispensable. It just means in any possible way you think of something, there has to be something there, but it doesn't have to be that same thing. Right. That was and my. Then, and then your infinite regress is a good example. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think Gabriel has to be conceded here that, let's say, take, you're trying to create an exception to the one of the five ways of Aquinas, the possibility and necessity. Say you're going back, there's a, you know, there's contingent causes. Your father and mother got together contingently and made you, and they had one that went back and goes back and goes back. What's to stop that? I mean, if you could have. <laughs> But there's something in each possible world that is contingent. What what's to say logically that there has to be something there at the beginning? We talked about this hunger. You talk about it in your title. And if you were uh, the reason we have to close that off any more than we have to close off the beginning of the negative number. I mean, uh, uh, there's nothing. Logically contradictory about it, there may be something in terms of our psyche. I mean, talk about that one. I think it's worth cold. Oh, I do so think we'll absolutely. Them. I think that's yeah. I, I'm a perfect agreement yeah. with what you're saying, but I guess I'm also impressed by the desire we have and the success that we have in satisfying it. In which, as we try to find intelligibility, where we don't have it. We succeed sometimes. Well, I agree. I mean, I did a talk three years ago where I talked about our hunger for, you know, for yeah. Yeah. explanations is very strong. And, but, but the desire, is there a fulfillment for it? You know, that, that's, uh, that's an argument that, that Lewis too makes deep it very That's psychology. No, it's not psychology. No. No. So there's more. There's a, there's a question that's been <laughs> soon. We'll be out of time, I expect. Oh, we have. I'm sorry. I, I don't hear very well. Um, Jacob Sherman's work on answer. Uh huh. Uh, I'm wondering whether or not this could be possibly part of this conversation in some kind of way. Um, for example, set of the doors in Anselm, and this by way of translating as quickly as I can, pointing to aspect of the name, the idea becomes somewhat actually epistemological rather than merely external, suggests that we might understand Anselm as understanding those that have been discussed, which might be more and as such, the believing in order to understand, rather than explicitly denoting yeah. aspects of reality, is not the least to do with divine identity, where the very of this does not make sense is in and of itself subject. Yeah. So, is something that Anselm is both addressing and saying if there isn't a doxological frame, can't. Be yeah, I, I I would be very friendly to that idea. Yeah, right. That the question itself is disclosive of that about which it asks. Yeah. 
Is that what you're saying? As part of it, yes. Yeah. But, but I think that necessarily understanding that there are epistemic things. Yeah. So our ability to grasp. Yes, it. yes, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as we're trying to push the limits. <laughs> We're four minutes for two questions. I'm not asking a lot, but you know, just to give you a, hmm? a sense. We have four minutes for two questions. Who's, uh, who's this? That, these will be last. Oh. Uh, so, sorry, the second part of my question is missing at the moment. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted to clarify. Do you think that for um, Anselm, that the what he raises in terms of thinking about what one can between the possibility mm -hmm. of something versus the reality of its consequential like existence as a result of <laughs> thinking of it. So like for example, you know, if if you can imagine a uh, unicorn, it doesn't mean it exists necessarily. But on the other hand, it does mean it is potential to exist. And it's based on your understanding of what's real. And so it already demonstrates its possibility within reality, whether or not it exists. So um, whereas something that could not possibly exist within any shape of reality we know of already stretches our ability to. image because yeah. how would something that we have no comparison to or would not fit within our rules make sense to us like a circle that's also a square simultaneously yeah right yeah, yeah. so you know saying it doesn't create an image it just underscores that it's missing do you think that that he has that kind of of a distinction in, in his mind, or should, or? Well, I think, I mean, the way I understand Anselm, which is very, very modest, is, is that he really had, he thought he discovered something about the A connection between the possibility of thinking something and its actuality right? of God. I can know by that fact that God is not only in thought, but also in reality. So I think there is a, a claim about reality based on the possibility of thinking certain thoughts. I, I think your comment about unicorn. is interesting because I do think thinking of a unicorn is different from thinking of a square circle because you can think of a horse with a single horn mm -hmm. <laughs> that's you know what that would be we don't see them but, but but so yeah I think that part of what you say is also that sound And then an equally short, I remember now the second question I want to ask equally. Equally short uh, response is fine, is um, in regards to the issue of attributes and then thinking of something that's higher than God, do we not run into this issue potentially? Essentially, an Orthodox Christianity, when we think about Jesus, who we affirm as a human being, as God. On earth, but then at the same time, as human on earth, not God as God. And this as a dilemma that no one ever raises this. God, and then running into 
the conflict of, oh, but there's a God above God in this form. It's not thinking of it that way. Well, I think lots of people do think that. It's okay. I, yeah, I mean, it's a great subject. <laughs> and you, you, can, you can read some resources to build papers later. Chuck. Chuck has offered a way of relating to that, right? I yeah, mean, of course. Uh, which is to say, the, the right question about Jesus is not what is Jesus' ontology, but rather what does the life of Jesus reveal to us, our response. Responsibilities are and that's that's the right question to ask. You know, Chuck and I love to argue about that. And then final. Uh, it, it, it seems that what we're talking about here with you, Daryl, is uh, thinking that uh, when it comes to what you are. The bulk of your paper was on thinking. Yeah. Uh, but your what, what is it? it? Has to do with the love of of wisdom and the mind's desire. <laughs> Those are affective, and I. I think of Jonathan Haidt's book that uh, has been influential, The Neocortex, but that's just giving reasons for what's going on. And so I'm wondering, putting all of that to this topic of God, if we shouldn't recognize community, have this affective uh, uh, hunger for God. And in light of all that we know, I would we're using metaphors at best to talk about the 